Hi everyone, so welcome to our webinar series. Tonight we will be talking about retirement planning for women. My name is Kathy Mealy. I'm one of the financial advisors here at Sensible Money. Uh, Dana Anspa is going to be presenting tonight. She's a CEO and the founder of Sensible Money. And we just found out today she was named one of the top 100 financial advisors by Investopedia. I'm going to read uh, what it is. I think it's such a great, great thing to have her recognized for this. It, it celebrates financial advisors who have contributed significantly, significantly to conversations about financial literacy, investment strategies, life stage planning, and wealth management. So Dana, huge congratulations to you, really. Um, Dana's located in Scottsdale. You can see her with holding the oranges in the picture that we have up there. I'm on the East Coast. I'm in Marblehead, Massachusetts. We work with clients all over the United States using just technology, just like we're using tonight, GoToMeeting. So with that, Dana, I'm gonna turn it over to you and we will get started with our webinar. Fantastic. So first of all, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening. And I want to make sure we customize what we talk about tonight as much as possible. So we do have both men and women, and I'm going to run a quick poll just to find out approximately how many of you are single, married, if you've had previous marriages. Don't worry, we're not tracking it. We just need to know that helps us customize some of the content. So I'm launching a poll and you're going to see that pop up on the screen right now. If you could take a minute and uh, I see it's collecting responses coming in and great. Awesome. We're just figuring out how many people are married, married less than 10 years or actually if you've had a previous marriage, but it was less than 10 years versus a previous marriage that was more than 10 years and a good about 40 percent already on a first marriage. Lucky you. Thank you so much. So about 40% of the people are first marriage, lucky, about 30% are single, and then um, the rest uh, have are, are you know divorced and either had marriages that were more or less than 10 years. So that helps us. Unfortunately, the reason we ask that is because the rules are so complicated. All of those things matter in terms of the advice that we give. And so we try to touch on something that's gonna be applicable for everyone. I want to talk a little bit about what women bring to the table. This is a, a, the cover on the right side of the screen you're seeing by is a book by Sally Krawcheck. And I don't know how many of you know who she is, but she has been known as one of the most senior women on Wall Street. When I heard her speak here in Phoenix a few years ago, I loved it. She described herself as having the honor of being fired on the cover of the Wall Street Journal twice. So she has made it to the top of her career and currently runs her, her own online investment firm and wrote this book called Own It, where she really talked about some of the strengths that women possess typically by nature. And one is risk awareness. Another is the ability to see things holistically, to look at the whole picture and not just focus on, on a narrow piece, to manage relationships, to have a long-term perspective, to have a love of learning, and to really have a drive for impact and meaning. And so when we look at those things, those things all contribute to financial success and to the financial decisions that you make, whether you're on your own or, or part of a household. And we're going to talk about how we can use those and raise our level of awareness around some of these qualities. One of the challenges is we do have challenges that I think men don't have. I'm going to share a few experiences of my own and see if anyone out there has had had a similar experience. So early in my career, I remember going to do an enrollment meeting for a small business and we were getting them set up on a small business retirement plan. So I was out there to talk to all of the participants. And uh, I got about five minutes in and a guy in the front row slams his hand down and says, well, this one ain't no hood ornament. And it was a compliment, sort of. Um, I, I could tell what he was saying was great. She knows what she's talking about, which which was nice. But it's just an unusual comment. And, you know, I remember another time I was at a big brokerage firm and one of my colleagues, who is a friend of mine, walks by me one day and he says, you know, why don't you just go get married, have some kids and have a nice life? What are you doing here? 
And I, it was just, I, I thought, what, why wouldn't I be here? I want to be here. I want a career. It's what I want to do. And I, I had another experience when, when I had a business partner that I had joined back in about 2006. And as he would introduce me as his business partner, many of his male friends and colleagues would, sit, would pull him aside and say, what do you mean business partner? You mean she works for you, right? And he and I used to get a, a laugh out of it. It's just the world we live in. It's it's pervasive. And I'm curious, just type in a simple yes if anyone out there uh, has had similar experiences. Have you ever had any experience where, not? I'm not even going to call it discriminated, but just something that, that kind of stood out to you is, what? It shouldn't work that way. And I'm, I'm definitely seeing some yeses come in. Yeah, it's it's common just to have those experiences. And I don't know if I would call it a glass ceiling so much. Um, I wouldn't say it's been that for me, but it's definitely been something, you know, that pervasively people don't expect women to be in finance. They don't, I've talked to other women who said, I never looked into it because I've heard women are good at math. Well, that's a myth. And, and when it's cultural, when there's this cultural myth around women in business, sometimes we make decisions on autopilot, not even realizing the capabilities that we have to, in order to, you know, that we really are good at math, that we can be good at math, that we can be good at these these decisions. So I don't look at it, you know, every, every, everybody has their own challenges to overcome, and, and these are some that, that we have. There's a, a group called WISER, the Women's Institute for a Secure Retirement, that has some great content. And this is from their site. They talk a little bit about the statistics. And this is a different type of challenge. This is a reality. Three out of five working women are in less than $30,000 a year. Three out of four are in less than 40,000. Half of women work in traditionally female, relatively low paid jobs without pensions. And I know pensions as a whole are, are becoming less common. And women retirees receive only half the average pension benefits that men receive. There's some additional challenges as to why that is. Women typically spend 12 years less in the workforce than men. And by our own choice, we're more likely to miss out on years due to staying home for caregiving roles. We may take care of the children. It could be a relative, an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, an in-law. We're more likely to leave paid employment because our spouse retired, so we want to retire with them. Or perhaps we have a an older spouse or a, any kind of a family member, a parent that needs care, we're often the ones that are caring for them. And the impact is that we have less social security benefits, less pension benefits, less retirement savings. And so when we're out there on our own, it's something to be aware of. It's just to understand that these decisions do have a, an impact on our financial well-being. Some additional realities, 40% of older women have virtually no income other than Social Security. We are more likely to underestimate our life expectancy. I think most of us know the statistics that women tend to live longer. So if you are 62 and older today, 60% can expect to live to age 90. And I love my picture here of this woman who went skydiving on her 100th birthday. Now, I have actually been skydiving three times. It is rough on your body. I can't even imagine at age 100. But I guess she thought, what, do I, what does she have to lose at that point? I think it's fantastic. But one of the takeaways is that we need to lengthen our planning horizons. And this isn't just for women. Overwhelmingly, the, when research is done, and the Society of Actuaries has actually done quite a bit of research on this topic, people have very short time horizons. We often think of cash flow in terms of the next year, the next five years. And when we think about retirement, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. We need to make decisions that are, of course, good for us today, but that are also going to be good for the 85-year-old or the 90-year-old the us. And I think of it in terms of you have to plan for you, but not just the you today, also the 90-year-old you. And you have to think about it's not necessarily a trade-off. There are ways to make decisions that can help both you today and the future you. And those are the decisions that we want to focus on this evening. So an outline. Here are the five main topics we're going to cover, taxes, social security, investing, long-term care, and estate planning. Now, in some of these topics, we'll go into a little more depth. In others, we're only going to be able to, to cover just a few key points, but I would encourage you as questions come up, type them into the chat box, and we will open it up for Q&A when we're done and try to address anything that might come up. Let's start by looking at taxes. These are the 2018 tax rates. And over here on the left, you see the single column. 
and then you see the married column. Now, the tax rates, let's say you are a, a married couple and, and you have retirement income that's falling right in here at about 75000 a year with Social Security and IRA withdrawals. And all of a sudden, one spouse passes and you now are over here at single tax rates. Well, that same $75,000 of income suddenly bumps up to a 22% tax rate. So it's a 10% increase in taxes. And at the same time, you just lost some social security benefits. So you have to make sure you're planning for that tax rates might change. It's not just where, you know, where they are today. And not only might they change because of a marital status changing, but right now with the tax code, we have some of the lowest tax rates we've ever seen in history, and they are scheduled to, to increase in 20, I think it's 2026 or 2027. Now, if you're a higher income earner, the jump can be even bigger. So we can look out here if it was a married couple at earning about 300,000 or 300,000 of retirement income, and suddenly one of them is at a single, it jumps over here. So that tax rate goes from 24 to 35%. These are big increases. And when you look at the statistics, by the time you get to 85, 60% of males who make it to 85 are married, only 15% of the women. We are less likely to remarry after a divorce or after being widowed. And so there's a high likelihood as a woman that you will be filing at single tax rates, even if you're not today. And there are some vehicles out there that we're going to talk about that are really beneficial, that can help you a lot should you be um, a single and at single tax rates. My favorite is the Roth IRA. Actually, it's got a strong contender that we'll talk about, but let me explain the difference between a Roth and a traditional IRA. So with the Roth IRA, you pay taxes now. When you earn the income, you don't get any kind of tax break. That applies to both Roth IRAs and a lot of 401k plans are now offering the ability to make after-tax Roth contributions. It's often called a designated Roth account. The rules are slightly different for Roth IRAs to Roth 401ks uh, in terms of how much you can contribute and how you access the funds, but both types of Roth accounts, you don't get a tax deduction when you contribute to them. But from that point on, the funds grow tax free. The advantage to that is if you should be at a higher tax rate later, having money that you can withdraw tax free is huge. One, every dollar of income that you have in retirement impacts two other things. It impacts how much in taxes you pay on your Social Security benefits, and it impacts how much in Medicare Part B premiums you pay. So Medicare Part B premiums are means tested. The higher your income, the more you pay. And so Roth withdrawals do not count in those formulas. And I've seen cases where people stuff so much money into these traditional accounts, deductible IRAs, 401ks, 403BBs, it's not really two Bs there, uh, but they stuff so much money in these deductible accounts that when they get to retirement, they have very little flexibility in, in how they structure their withdrawals and very little opportunity to reduce their tax bill. Roth IRAs are the answer. And I often call it the wonder woman of retirement accounts, or I will tell women, it's not diamonds that are your best friend, it's Roth IRAs. So look at funding Roths, ask your employer if they have a designated Roth account, and examine the benefits of converting IRAs to Roth IRAs. So you can put up to 5,500 a year in a Roth IRA if your income falls within the income limitations. And we will Let's see if I can pull this slide over. I cannot. I was going to try to pull another slide over to show you, but I will read the limits off to you instead. So if you are a single and you make over 120000 of adjusted gross income, your ability to contribute to a Roth IRA will be limited but you can still make designated Roth contributions to a 401k plan, and there are no income limitations on your ability to convert a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA. When you convert, every dollar you take out of the traditional IRA shows up on your tax return, you pay taxes on it, but from that point forward in the Roth IRA, it grows tax-free. And Roth IRAs do not have required minimum distributions on them. 
So again, single, if you make over 120,000 of adjusted gross income, the Roth IRA is off the table, but the 401k and the conversions you can still do. If you're married, that income cutoff is 189,000 of adjusted gross income where the Roth IRA is off the table, but the Roth 401k and the Roth conversions you are still eligible for. Look for every opportunity you can to, to fund Roths. There are a few exceptions to that if you are in a super high tax bracket now and we project that for Forward that it absolutely will be lower later. That is the time where the Roth may not make sense, but for most people, funding Roths can make a big impact on how their retirement plan looks and how much after tax income they get. So then there are HSAs, which are amazingly enough are even better. You just can't get as much money into them. So health savings accounts, you don't pay taxes now or later, you actually get a deduction. When you put the money in, like you do with an IRA, the money grows tax-free, and as long as you use it for qualified medical expenses, you don't pay taxes on it when you use it. For example, I have a health savings account that comes with a debit card. It's with HSA Bank. If I have a crown, I need another crown right now, a dental work, then I can use my debit card. I can, but I choose not to. I want to use my HSA as another tax-deferred, tax-free savings vehicle that eventually I will use in retirement. So I choose to fund my HSA every single year. I plan to let it grow until retirement. And at that point, I will have this extra pot of money that I can use tax-free for, for medical expenses. You can only fund HSAs up to age 65. And after 65, you can use them to pay for health insurance premiums, including Medicare Part B and long-term care insurance premiums. Now, your HSA limits for 2018, you can put 3,450 in. If you're 55 or older, that limit goes up to 4,450. There's also some family limits. If you have a spouse that has a family plan, the rules get complicated. So ask your employer if you can fund an HSA. If you are self-employed, then look into a health plan that is HSA eligible. So to be eligible to fund an HSA, it has to be paired with a health insurance high deductible plan. So let's take a look at Social Security. This is the second poll that I want to run. So quick question. You're going to see this poll come up on the screen again. What is the earliest age that you can collect Social Security? So I'm launching it now. You should see that come up. What do you think is the earliest age that you can collect Social Security retirement benefits? I should specify that because disability can, can be collected at other ages. So the earliest age you can collect Social Security retirement benefits. Fantastic. Overwhelmingly, people chose age 62. There's a few, a few other choices um, that I see. So I will close out the poll. And age 62 is the answer. So age 62 is the earliest you can begin your own retirement benefits or a spousal benefit. Now, you can collect a widow benefit as early as age 60, but it will be a reduced benefit if you collect at that age. But this is not your retirement benefit. It is a different type of benefit in a different formula that's calculated. So let's take a look at Social Security for a single person. This is how most people look at the Social Security decision. They go, great, if I live past a certain age, then it doesn't make a difference. So we call it your, your break-even chart right here. It's usually right around 82 or 83, where if you collected at the earliest age possible, which was 62, and then we had some alternate strategies in here, like collecting at 65, 66, or the software we use spits out a suggested strategy, which is usually collecting at age 69 or 70. So you can see that you get less money by collecting earlier the red line, or you actually get more money early on out here in the red line. But the longer you live, the less that worked to your benefit. Now, if you are single and you have no previous marriages that were over 10 years, this is all you need to look at. The break-even age does actually have a, have a big it's one of the biggest factors in your Social Security decision, but it is still not the only factor. So let's look at some of the other rules. First of all, there's something called full retirement age. So for those born 1943 to 1955, full retirement age is 66. If you collect before that age, there's a formula that reduces what you get. And if you collect after that age, you get something called a delayed retirement credit. 
Then there is something called an earnings limit. So even if you're single and you go, well, I have some health conditions. I don't know if I will live to even average life expectancy. I think I should take my benefits at 62. If you are still working, the earnings limit applies. And what happens is it, it will reduce your benefits. So you can earn up to $17,040, 17,040 in 2018, and not see any reduction in your social security benefits. But if you earn over that, they start reducing your benefits. And so I've seen people get no social security benefits or have to pay them all back because they were still working and they didn't know about the earnings limit. Once you reach your full retirement age, that's why understanding what your full retirement age is, is so important. Once you reach that, the earnings limit no longer applies. So you get benefits starting right at your full retirement age. You don't even have to think about the earnings limit. You can earn as much as you want. Matter of fact, there is a special rule for the year you reach full retirement age that allows you to earn as much as $45,360 and not see any reduction in your benefits. So singles do need to pay attention to the earnings limit. There are also taxes, which are separate. I often see the earnings limit referred to as a tax. It's not. Taxes are a completely separate set of rules. Your Social Security benefits flow into a separate formula. You can look it up on the IRS website, and that formula looks at your other sources of income, and it spits out how much of your Social Security benefits will be subject to income tax. The great news is the maximum is 85%. So always up to 15% of your Social Security benefits are tax-free. And sometimes this is where the Roth comes in. If we're able to convert all of someone's assets to a Roth IRA by the time they start Social Security, we often see cases where we are, we are able to restructure things so that someone's entire Social Security benefits are tax-free. Because again, the Roth distributions do not count in that formula. Another thing to think about, if you work in a state or have worked for a, a government agency typically that provides a pension where no Social Security taxes were withheld, then you will be subject to something called the windfall elimination provision and the government pension offset. So on the right side of the slide, you will see the states where you see this, see people impacted. Teachers in these 14 states are often impacted by this special rule. The challenge with this rule is when you get your Social Security statement, it doesn't factor this in. So it'll show a certain amount of benefit that you're going to get, when in reality, that's not what you're going to get at all. It is something that I find very misleading. There are too many people that are subject to this that have no idea. So they're planning on their retirement. They think they're going to get the amount of Social Security on their statement plus their pension. And what Social Security is sending them on their statement is not correct. It's not factoring in this provision. Then there are spousal benefits. So all of these top four things are things that singles need to think about. If you have a previous marriage over 10 years or you're married, then you start looking at spousal and widow benefits. So the maximum amount of Social Security you can receive based on a spouse's record is 50% of what they would get at their full retirement age. And it's interesting how these rules work because depending on age differentials, I could have a spouse who just reached full retirement age, let's say they're 66, and their spouse is only 62. They're still eligible for what that spouse would get at, at their full retirement age. It's, it's interesting the way the rules work. They're so complicated, that's why we use software to run the numbers for each client. And then there's a widow benefit, which is always equal to 100% of what your spouse was getting if they've already collected or what they would have gotten if they hadn't filed yet. So if we are recommending that one spouse delays the start of their benefits to age 70 and they were to pass away at 69, you're still going to get the increase that they got up until age 69. So let's look at some examples. This, for example, is a, a sample of a, how a widow benefit works. So Unfortunately, this person went into the Social Security office and the horizontal numbers you're seeing um, show what she would get if she collected her own retirement benefit. And the widow benefit underneath shows what she would get if she collected the widower benefit. And you can see that her retirement benefit is larger. And so Social Security was trying to insist that she should collect her own retirement benefit. But what we were able to share with her is look, the, here's how the rules work. You are able to collect your widow benefit now, the smaller amount, and then when you get to age 70, you can switch over to that $3,300 a month. 
And that actually results in far more money over her lifetime than if she had only collected her retirement benefit. Now, one of the key things we had to consider in this person's case is that the widow was a husband. She had, they had been married for over 20 years. He had passed away and she was considering getting remarried. So we said, you can't get remarried before age 60 or you're going to lose this option. And so they got married just after her 60th birthday. It was good that she was working with an advisor to help understand these options and put actually tens of thousands of dollars more in her pocket. The challenge is most of the Social Security workers don't know these rules. They're not supposed to give advice. They often think that they're telling you to do the right thing by claiming a higher benefit. It, it, we see bad advice come out of there all the time. And I don't blame anyone. You know, they're probably overworked and undertrained, and there's no way they can have the level of knowledge that some retirement experts have. And so just be skeptical. Do your research before you go in and claiming. I have countless stories of people who were told they couldn't do what we told them they could do. We had to, s to print out the rules and send them back in with those rules to, in order to get it done. So here's another example of how earnings or a benefit can work on an ex-spouse. Now the rules recently changed. So this is most applicable if you were born on or before January 1st, 1954. For any of you born on or before January 1st, 1954, you still have the ability to file what's called a restricted application. For those of you born after that, you don't, can't do it. In this case, this person had an ex-spouse and so instead of claiming her own benefits over here, she was able to claim a benefit on her ex and then again, switch over to her own at 70. These bars are showing the difference in the lifetime benefits that she, she receives. So she could have collected her own benefit as early as possible, which is still what most people think they should do. That's the red bar. And over her lifetime, she'd get about 296,000, or she could follow this claiming recommendation and over her lifetime, get about 362,000. This is real money. That, that goes into your pocket by understanding the rules and, and following a customized approach. So here are some of the rules that apply to these spousal and widow benefits. To be eligible for a survivor's benefit on your spouse's record, you had to be married at least nine months. I have seen older couples, even up until their 80s, get married just to make sure that someone would be eligible for the other survivor benefit. One year to be eligible for a spousal benefit, if you're getting divorced, you have to be divorced two years before you're eligible for a spousal benefit on an ex-spouse's record. And to claim benefits on an ex-spouse's record, you had to have a prior marriage that was at least 10 years in length. And we talked about the widow survivor benefit. You cannot have remarried prior to age 60. Now, I believe you can have remarried and then divorced again before age 60, um, but you can't have remarried and still be married um, before age 60 for, for that to apply. So let's look at a case study that combines both the tax rules we talked about and these social security claiming strategies. This is not made up. This is a real person, a real client. Um, she is 62 this year and she is retired. Now, this screenshot is a projection of her assets. So she's always starting out with the exact same amount, $842,000. And the blue color represents what we call a brokerage account. It's not in a Roth IRA. It's not in a 401k plan. This pretty teal ocean color represents what's in the traditional 401k or IRA. And the orange sliver represents a Roth. So initially she thought she got, she got laid off. Um, she was forced into early retirement. And she thought, I'm going to have to start Social Security as early as possible. And so if she does that and also withdraws what she needs to from her assets, this is the path we projected her, her assets would take. We assumed a 5% rate of return and that her living expenses were going up at 3%. And anything not coming from Social Security, she had to withdraw from, from her portfolio. So in this projection, she gets out to age 90 with a little over 1.35 million. And so that looks pretty good. She's not spending down her assets. This plan falls in, in what we call solid territory. But what happens if she takes Social Security at 66? 
Well, notice this blue line dips down. She has to draw a little bit more out of her own accounts to fill up the gap. She still needs the same standard of living. So when we talk about starting Social Security at a later date, we don't mean wait and don't retire until then. We mean look at some alternate ways of accomplishing your standard of living. In this case, what if we just take more out of your portfolio? And people get scared. They've worked so hard to save this money. It's like, oh no, I don't want to take it out of my pot. But what if we looked at it as all your pot? And how do we put all of these pieces together to give you the biggest pot possible? So when you look at it that way, yes, yeah, she spent down this blue bar. I'm going to go back for, for a second so you can kind of see the change in the pattern. Here the blue bar stays pretty level. Here we're starting to spend it down, and she starts Social Security later. But look, now she has $1.45, $100,000 more from that one decision. Wasn't an investment decision, had nothing to do with what the stock market did. That's a big number. Now, what we could do instead is say, great, you know what? You can spend 100,000 more along the way. We don't have to just wait and let it accumulate at the end. Under this plan, you can spend 100,000 more and still finish with the, the same amount of assets as in the original plan. But what happens if she takes Social Security at 70? Well, once again, we see the impact. Now the blue bar, is going down, she's spending down her own assets, and then she starts Social Security, but she gets a much higher amount, so her assets grow. Now we have 1.513 million, again, even more, so she could simply spend more along the way, or decide she wanted to leave more to heirs, or gift more to charity, or maybe take a few extra trips, or do something along the way, and this has nothing to do with investments. And then I'm going to add in one more thing. Let's say we added in Roth conversions. So if she delays Social Security to age 70, she's in a very low tax rate for this time period, for these eight years. And during that time period, we can move money from the teal account to the orange account. She's going to pay taxes at that time. But now she has this pot of money that she can draw from tax-free. And now her assets at, at age 90 are 1.535. That's $183,000 more than the original plan. Now, when we run this, we're not saying, great, who, you know, maybe you don't want to pass on $183,000 more. You can. The strategy allows you to do that. But then we run a final version and say, that means you could spend $183,000 more along the way and still end up in the same place. This is why I get so excited about planning. You can make a, a real difference with planning. It's not about what stock you pick or what mutual fund you pick. It's about these planning decisions. So. Let's move on to investing. Now, this is what the media likes to focus on. And we research has shown that men and women do look at investing very differently. Men naturally tend to look at it as competition. The long term is someone else's problem. They don't like to ask for advice. These quotes that you're seeing here come out of a Wall Street Journal article called On Mother's Day, Give Her Reins to the Portfolio. I love the title. But when you think about it, it's just natural. Men do have more testosterone. This is not a character default. It's the way we're made. And so competition tends to be more natural. They tend to be risk takers. Bragging about things is, is more natural and wanting to compete and wanting to get the highest rate of return possible. Women, on the other hand, tend to put safety first. So Amazingly enough, we're more inclined to wear seatbelts, avoid cigarette smoking, we're more inclined to floss and brush our teeth, and we've even been shown to be 40% less prone than men to run yellow traffic lights. I find this fascinating. More interestingly, we're less afflicted by something called overconfidence. So there is a whole study of, of it's called behavioral finance, and it studies how we make decisions when it comes to economics and money. And we are not rational creatures. None of us are. Matter of fact, you could ask someone if you are a, an average driver, and everyone will say they're above average. So who are the, the below average drivers? So there's numerous studies that show that we are all prone to being overly confident in our abilities. And when it comes to investing, that can be very dangerous. So the fact that we more naturally put safety first can be great when it actually comes to our retirement years, but there can be a downside to that too. 
this is Sally Krawcheck again, who looked at these statistics and, and looked at assets controlled by women and 71% of it is in cash. So when women control assets, they often are more hesitant to invest it. They don't know who to turn to. And there are a lot of financial salespeople out there. It's natural to be skeptical. And so often they just hold the money in savings accounts or bank CDs. And that isn't always good either. They're missing out on market gains and then their savings that are often less to start with because of less years in the workforce now also aren't growing as fast. So let's look at what we can do to overcome that. Some basic, basic about investing. Here are what I call the two most important questions you can ask. One, can I lose any money? And of course you want the answer to be no. Two, can I lose all my money? And you definitely want the answer to be no to this one. And I think what often happens is we have this fear that we could lose all our money. And so we think that that our choices are either I'm going to take a risk level five, which I describe as taking on the risk, you could lose all your money. And I don't want that. So I'm going to put everything here in the bank savings accounts where I know it, I can't lose any money. But there is a better way. Let's take a look at how we could mix these choices together. So I think of safety where I can't lose any money versus growth, where there's different types of growth investments. So the trade-off is that as you move toward one corner of this triangle, you move away from the others. So if I want more safety, I've got less income, less growth. That's, that's just the way it is. And the process of building a portfolio is finding the right mix of these assets. Particularly, if we look at the growth corner, this shows the growth of a dollar from 1926 to 2016. The orange line represents small cap stocks. The red line represents large cap stocks. And then we see our safety oriented investments down here in blue and green. So obviously growth pays off if we have a long time frame, but most of us don't have 90 years. And what we're scared about are these dips that we see right here. So, oh my gosh, what if I invest right here? and the market immediately goes down like it did in 2008, 2009. Well, let's suppose that your retirement was 10 years away. It didn't really matter, did it? If you didn't know that dip happened, you would just see this steady increase. And so it all depends on your time frame. If you have a process in place where the money that you need in the short term is down here in these safe investments, then you can invest using growth investments without feeling that level of stress and worry and anxiety because you're looking at a long time horizon, a 10, 15, sometimes it's 20 years away. There is a portion of your portfolio that you are not going to touch for 20 years. You need that portion of your portfolio working for you. Now, the strategy you follow often depends on whether you're in the accumulation mode. So let's assume you're 10 years or more away from retirement. And we're going to show how the goals start to shift as you get closer to retirement within that 10-year window and then already retired. So what you're looking at here is a traditional way of looking at investing when you are accumulating. The goal is to maximize return for any given level of risk. And when we look at returns down here at the bottom, you're seeing you could have a 100% bond portfolio that averaged a 6% rate of return and never had a negative return. That's not bad. Out here, though, over that same time frame, 1973 to 2016, if you were 100% stocks, you averaged 13% a year. Your money grew so much faster, but you had to live through a big dip that we saw on that previous slide. From March of 08 to February of 09, your portfolio was down 51%. Now, if you have a long time horizon, you're 15 years, 10 years, at least 10 years away from retirement, we encourage people to be as high on this, this risk parameter as they're comfortable being. You want to give yourself the biggest potential for return. It doesn't mean it will happen. There's a, there's a range of possible outcomes, depending on whether you retire or, or start investing into a really strong bull market or whether you start investing at the beginning of a bear market. So you don't know what the outcome is, but you can never participate in these higher returns if you don't have growth in your portfolio. So if you have a long time frame, you, you want to tilt it toward growth. But this decision starts to shift. So instead of risk versus return, when you look at the decumulation side, now 
this is decumulation means we are withdrawing money. We saved it and now it's time to live off our acorns. Here, the trade-off is between average remaining assets, so we see that on the vertical axis, and annual consumption. So let's say I have a $2 million portfolio and I wanna take $10,000 a year out. Well, I'm likely gonna leave $2 million or even more to my heirs. But if I wanna take 60,000 a year out, that might be possible, but I'm gonna spend my principal down over my lifetime and perhaps leave nothing to my heirs. And so that's the trade-off, is that balance between how much can I take out and make sure that I have a reliable retirement income, a reliable standard of living without taking on the risk that I might run out one day and while still meeting whatever my bequest goals are. Now, I meet people who are like, I wanna die with a dollar in the bank, my kids will be fine, or they have no kids. And so they wanna tilt more toward the right side of the spectrum. And I have others who are very, very concerned about passing on uh, a wealth to their children. And so they lean more toward the left side of this graph. This requires a different way of investing. And the best way to illustrate it is with this next set of graphs. This is research done by Michael Kitsis and Wade Pfau. And I mentioned that your outcome depends on when you retire. So what we're looking at here is a 1982 retirement scenario. And the yellow line represents this more traditional way of investing as if you were an accumulator. It says static, that means you have a 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio, and you rebalance it each and every year. The red and the green line represent other ways of drawing down. The red line represents you take 100 minus your age, and that's what you have in stocks. So every year that you're older, you have a little less in stocks. And the green line represents what's called rising equity glide path. This is actually the process that we use in our, in our investing. And so it says, I'm gonna look at assets in terms of when they need to be used. The technical term is called asset liability matching. So just as I was showing you on the other graph, if it's money I'm not gonna need to touch for 10 years or more, I'm gonna have it in growth. But if it's money I'm going to need closer, I want it in safe investments where the answer to can I lose any money is no. So it helps protect against those big market declines. So here, if we retire into a great market, historically 1982 is the best time you could retire. What you see is that all three strategies did really well, but the yellow one did the best. At the end of the plan, you had just over 700,000 in assets for every 100,000 that you started with. What you were drawing out over the meantime was about 4% a year. In the green line, you still did well with over 400,000 in assets. But what happens if you retired in 1966 and used these exact same three strategies? Well, here we see the yellow and the red line, the principal value was depleted at the end of 30 years, where the green strategy principal was able to be maintained. This is the trade-off that you face as you start to enter the 10 years prior to retirement, is your goal shifts from maximizing returns. If I want a strategy that's gonna give me the highest potential for return, I'm gonna use the yellow line, right? And this is what happens if I get a good market. But if I'm in the decumulation phase where I'm drying out, I really want a strategy that's gonna protect my standard of living no matter what market I get. And there are certain approaches like this green line that tend to work a little bit better. For various reasons, a lot of it is simply behaviorally, the way that we think about the money when it's segregated into safe investments, I know that's what I'm living on for the next 10 years, and growth investments, mentally we're able to weather the market's volatility a little better and thus make better decisions. Now, women are uniquely suited to make these kinds of decisions. This is from an ABC News article, Women Make Better Investors Than Men, But Why is the name of the article. And this researcher found that women are more in touch with their feelings, more able to control how their emotions might weigh on their investing decisions. That makes complete sense to me. I've had to deal with the monthly roller coaster of emotions my whole life. You get better at saying, you know what? No, I'm just feeling sad today, or I'm just feeling this or that. And you are able to separate that from the important decisions that you make. And we do have a, a a unique ability to do that and that can be applied to investing that rather than letting our emotions drive the investing decision we can be a little more strategic about it and use an approach that's going to help protect the downside and it's great because we're not so concerned about leaving something on the table I still have clients come in that are going through this transition that are so worried if they don't 
beat the S&P 500 index or have the highest return possible. And we have to reiterate, that's not our objective. Our objective is to make sure you have a retirement paycheck that we've designed for you for the rest of your life, no matter what market comes, comes along. And that may mean if a really strong market comes along, we might leave a little bit on the table. But it also means if something really bad comes along, we've still protected your standard of living. That is the objective. So let's take a look at long-term care. I've always loved this slide. It went around by Facebook and I don't know whose it is and I had to snag it. I just, it just got a kick out of it. Um, this has always been my long-term care plan is to have great girlfriends and hopefully one day we'll all be roommates and be able to share resources. The challenge is when we think about long-term care, when you look at healthcare costs, and I see a typo in my slide here, we often think that long-term care is going to be covered under this pie chart. So here you're seeing Medicare Part B, Part D, Medicare Supplement, Dental, Out-of-Pocket. All of these are expenses that we incur, and on average, we might expect to spend between six and 12000 a year when you add all of this up. Now, many of us are already spending that today. I know what I spend on chiropractic and dental and medical already. And so it might not be a sudden increase, but just, just with inflation, there are expenses that are going to continue into retirement. But none of this includes long-term care. And when we think of long-term care, it doesn't mean nursing home. Long-term care is defined as needing assistance with two out of the six activities of daily living. So you're seeing those here, eating, cooking, bathing, cleaning, dressing, toileting, transferring, which is just getting up and down out of bed, for example, continence. Other activities are things like managing medications and finances, um, being able to drive. And so if you need help with two out of six activities of daily living, you can qu probably qualify for benefits if you have a long-term care policy. It's not just nursing home care. Many policies cover someone to come into the home and, and assist. And that's usually what most people want nowadays. So the question is, how are you going to pay for it? Well, if you have $2 million or more in assets, often you fall in, uh, and I hate rules of thumb because I, I'm such a firm believer you need to look at it customized to you, but the rule of thumb is that if you have $2 million or more in assets, you may be self-insured. You can take on the risk and say, you know what, if long-term care comes along and I need an extended you know, full care facility, I have Alzheimer's or dementia, for example, or Parkinson's, then I'm just going to pay out of pocket. If you have 500000 or less in assets, the standard of rule of thumb is, well, I will spend my assets down and, and then go on Medicaid. And, you know, once you're, you're out of assets, there are certain limits as to what you can keep. Then Medicaid steps in. You won't get necessarily your choice as to quality of care, but there is a level of care that is provided. If you're in that mid-range or you just want peace of mind, that's when you start to look at long-term care insurance and say, great, what does it cost and what type of benefit would it provide and would it make me feel better to know that there was some insurance in place should that come along? It's like any type of insurance. You look at the numbers, you decide you either want to shift the risk to the insurance company or you want to bear the risk and know that you'll figure out a way to handle it yourself. There are some other options. You can buy into a continuing care community while you're still healthy. Oftentimes it requires a lump sum and I've had many retirees who sell their primary residence, use that lump sum to buy into the continuing care community. They shop around, they find one that they like in an area they like, and then as they need care, it's just provided. Sometimes there is still an extra cost. And so a long-term care insurance in many cases can be used along with buying into a continuing care community. And then there's my plan, the Golden Girls plan. Actually, I, I probably will buy long-term care insurance too, but I love the idea of pooling resources and I wish we would see more of that. Many single people tend to get isolated as they get older. Reconnecting with friends, that's what makes social media so great, can be critical. Um, finding someone to share resources. You know, maybe you have someone and you need help. You need to hire someone to come in and do some of the cooking and cleaning. If you have someone you can share that with, it can make a big difference. So the last topic before we move on to Q&A is estate planning. And there are so many aspects of this. One, talking to your family. If you do have children, 
talk to them, share your finances with them. They care. Now, I know there's exceptions. Everyone has the black sheep family member. Or maybe there is one you shouldn't talk to, but overwhelmingly, it, it makes sense to share. I've had clients bring in their children who are their successor trustees and have me explain the plan to them. And it's great because if something happens now, I have a face to, to put with that name also. Open up that conversation. It can be difficult, but open it up. Let people know it's not because you're planning on going anywhere. You just want to make sure everyone knows that you're okay and, and that there's a plan in place. What type of plan should be in place? Well, there are two things that I see overlooked, and they are the most important component of estate planning. One, properly structured beneficiary designations. So any account that you have, a Roth, an IRA, a 401k, any kind of employer plan has a beneficiary designation. That supersedes your will. It doesn't matter what your will says or if you have a will, whatever's on that beneficiary designation is what's going to happen. If you have an X named on that, you know what, that account's gonna go to your ex. And we have seen this happen. Life insurance policies that have old beneficiary designations. Maybe it was a life insurance policy you had at a previous employer, never thought about changing it. X is still named on it. Or a relative that might not be with you anymore, or you've had children since then and never updated the beneficiary designations. So making sure you have an inventory and have updated those is critically important because it will override anything else you do. It'll override a will or a trust. It doesn't matter. Same with titling on your accounts and real property. So anytime you open an account, it has an account title. That is a legal document. That title tells the institution what to do. If it's a joint account, it says if something happens to one party, this account legally belongs to the other party. There are what are called designated beneficiaries, transfer on deaths, often abbreviated as a TOD, or payable on deaths, often abbreviated as a POD, that you can add to most bank or investment accounts that aren't retirement accounts that will name a beneficiary. There are now property deeds. They're often called a beneficiary deed that you can file with your county so that your real estate can pass right on to someone. That is much, much better do not add children jointly on the title. There are tax consequences to that. We strongly advise against it. There's a better way. You can add a beneficiary deed that says, when I pass, this asset automatically belongs to someone and it avoids the probate process. Those are the two most important things you can do. Then you have wills, powers of attorney, and trusts. Trusts are critical in terms of naming someone that can take over if you're incapacitated. So particularly if you're single, you want to have someone that you've named that should you not be able to manage your finances, that they can step in and manage them for you. And so the difference between these titling, many times with beneficiary designations and proper titles, you can get all your assets to pass right to the people you want without having to do a lot of complicated planning. Where the trust becomes really valuable is should you be incapacitated, it makes it very easy. Um, I have a client in her late 80s, she has one daughter and we were able to add the daughter as a co-trustee and it's made things so much easier because she just isn't able to make decisions the way that she was and now there's someone there that she trusts that can make decisions right alongside her and make sure that she can still access her money without having to go to court. If you don't have that, it's cumbersome. You have to go to court and try to gain a durable power of attorney. It can be very cumbersome. Other considerations, cohabitation. Many people choose not to enter a formal second marriage, but they may be living with someone. And there are community property states or common law marriage states where Arizona, for example, if you've lived together for seven years, then the state would deem you to be married. So look into those rules if you are in a cohabitation situation and make sure you know, you know if, if you're going to be subject to any of those rules. And the last thing under the estate planning section that I really want to talk about is pension choices. This is a real live situation I encountered. It was a second marriage and the husband had a million dollars in a, in a 401k plan. He was retired and then he had to choose his pension option. So he chose um, $6,000 a month for life. So he chose the single life option. So no benefit passed along to his spouse. Unfortunately, he passed away very shortly thereafter. I think he collected benefits less than a year, and he had two sons from a previous marriage. 
So what happened is he, he still took care of his second wife. The million dollars was all left to her and um, the pension stopped. But what would have happened if, if he would have sat down with a planner and coordinated things? If he would have chose the joint life option, the $6,000 a month over 25 years would have been worth about $1.2 million to his surviving spouse. And he could have left the million dollars to his sons. So just with planning, he could have accomplished so much more, actually left a million dollars more in assets to the people that he cared about. And this is where it's so important to, to look at things as a team and to say, great, how do we step back and make the decisions that are going to benefit all of the parties? A few other things, one other thing to touch on, it's not really under estate planning, but if you know someone who's going through a divorce, I would advise sending them to wiserwomen.org. You all can access a copy of these slides. There's a, a booklet they can download, um, how to take control of retirement benefits. It's very important to understand the impact of how you divide assets and what works, what's fair at that stage. So if you're looking for financial advice, let me give you a little overview of the industry. There is FINRA, which regulates brokers, anyone who carries a securities license. When I started my career, I started over here. And a securities license allows you to collect a commission. So there's something called a Series 6, Series 7. And then there are what are called investment advisors that fall either under SEC or state registration. Sensible Money, we are an SEC registered advisor. And Many advisors have both. They can carry both a, a securities license and be an investment advisor and often refer to themselves as fee-based. So the bulk of people who call themselves financial advisors or planners would fall in this middle area. There are people who only work on a commission basis and they only carry either securities or insurance license. And there's this sliver over here called fee only. So of approximately 350,000 people in the U.S. who use the term financial advisor, only about 2% practice as true fee-only advisors. I've seen that statistic vary between 2 and 6%. We fall on this fee-only side. We sell no commission products. I strongly encourage people who are looking for advice to look for someone who is fee-only. I think it is the best way to get unbiased, objective advice. There are different legal standards that we are held to than people over here. Although much of the public knows that, they still tend to disregard it, which is unfortunate because it protects your interests. Working with a fee-only advisor, there's a, a much higher, the law is on your side in protecting you that the advice is, is in your best interest. Interest. So the next question is, do financial planners add value? Well, this is a piece that Vanguard put together. Um, I have the link here, but they talked about just some of the, the tools that advisors bring to the table, rebalancing, behavioral coaching. My favorite are asset location and withdrawal order. So we talked a lot about Roth IRAs versus traditional IRAs, and there are also ways to locate which investments go in which type of accounts. And these two things alone can add up to over about one and a half percent in returns. So when Vanguard added all of that up, they quantified the advice as perhaps adding up to about 3% a year. Morningstar did the same thing. They have a paper called Alpha, Beta, Gamma. And Gamma was what they talked about the, the planning decisions. How do we quantify that? It doesn't show up on a performance report. And so they looked at how holistic advisors, what you know, advisors that are looking at the whole picture in these five areas can increase retirement income, they said, by about 28% or that was equivalent to about 1.82% a year in additional returns. There's numerous research that shows that these planning decisions add real value. They put real money in your pocket. People tend to say, but can you get me a better investment return? That's not our job. Our job is to help you accumulate more wealth. And we want to have you to have more after-tax retirement income. And so those types of planning decisions, like the one we looked at earlier that resulted in $180,000 more wealth, that type of planning decision doesn't show up in an investment return, but it adds money to your pocket. That's what we get excited about.
So if you are looking to work with someone and want to know more, I would certainly encourage you to read Control Your Retirement Destiny. I am so honored about the reviews it has on Amazon. It's really amazing to see so many reviews and particularly reviews from other professionals in the industry. And I've gotten a lot of feedback that it's understandable. So if you want to take a deeper dive, I would encourage you to take a look at the book. You can also reach out to us. Uh, we work with both couples and singles, typically age 50 and older. Our initial plans range in price from about 4000 to 6900 It depends on the complexity of your situation, and we discuss that in a complimentary introductory meeting. You are welcome to either visit our website or email the letters PMQ for pre-meeting questions, and uh, we'll send you a link to a, a questionnaire that kind of kicks off that process of scheduling a, an introductory meeting. So with that, I ran fast to try to get done in an hour and uh, leave time for questions and answers. So Kathy is going to come back on and we are going to encourage you. I see questions have already come in. Anything that you might want to ask, now's your chance. Great. Um, Dana, I had a question uh, about uh, a woman who is retiring. She's asking about the FSA, not the HSA account, but her question is, can an FSA, uh, the dollar balance, be used after retirement, uh, in particular, um, be used to pay for Medicare Part B or supplemental premiums? I don't know. We will have to look that one up and get back to you. The rules around flexible savings accounts are very different than the rules around health savings accounts. So one of the great things about the HSAs is it's not use it or lose it. You can accumulate the money, take it with you. It's yours. I believe the flexible savings accounts, and unless they've restructured them, they often have a use it or lose it, like the money that goes in, you have to use it by the end of the year, and there's different variations depending on how your employer set it up. So that one we'll have to look up and, and try to get back to you on. Yeah, we'll certainly get back. I do believe that uh, FSA, you cannot use them for Medicare premiums, but like, like no. Dana said, we'll look at it and we'll get back to you. On that one. Um, another question on long-term care. What's the best age to buy long-term care insurance? Well, it depends on who you talk to. Many people will say the younger the better. A long-term care event could strike at any time. I've seen people look at them in their 40s where the premium is going to be a lot lower and then you're going to carry that premium for the rest of your life. The longer you wait, the more expensive it gets. I strongly encourage people to look at them around age 55. I think that's a great age. I am starting to look myself. I'm 47. And so I think just about, I, many of you know who follow my work, I ride motorcycles. And so I think, wow, what if something should happen? I would want to know that that long-term care policy was in place. It's not just Alzheimer's or dementia. It could be a car accident. It, there's all kinds of things that could happen that could cause you to need care. So if that's a risk you want to cover, you can start looking at it at, at actually at any age. Question with estate planning. Um, estate planning in a single woman. Who can you name as an executor if you don't have suitable relatives and most of your friends are older than you and don't have enough assets to be attractive to a trust company and there are no children? This is a great question, and you are not the only person that has encountered this. There's a woman I know here in town, and whatever community you are in, what you might want to search for is somebody who acts as an independent fiduciary trustee. There are what they call trustee services. If you go to a bank, they're going to have a pretty hefty fee, but there are attorneys who will take on that role. Usually you are paying them some type of an annual fee or they will collect some type of a fee when you pass as your executor, uh, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. They're, they're also obligated to provide the service and, and to make sure that someone is there to do that when the time comes. So that's what I would encourage you to do is look around for the right type of legal service that acts as, I've seen them called independent fiduciaries, independent trustees, um, certain attorneys that will take on that role. Next question, Dana, what is the full retirement age for those born after 1955? After 19, it might be nine. It might be. Um, I'm gonna quick back really quick, cause see if I can find it in the notes for that slide. 
it might be age 67, but I can't remember. There are so many rules, and I even wrote a book on Social Security called Social Security Sense, and uh, despite that, they don't stick. So 1955, <laughs> if you were born at least January 2nd or later, it's 66 and two months. That's, yeah, that's 60, 1960, I believe it'll jump up to 67. 1960 is when it goes 67. to age 67. So what happens is between 1955 and 1959, every year it, they tack on a few months. It goes from 66 to 66 and two months, 66 and four, 66 and six, eight, 10. And then by the time you get to 1960, it's age 67. Uh, so we have a couple more, Dana. Uh, I think you said, here's a question, I think you said that co-titling with your children is not a good idea. One of my sons chips in with a mortgage and down payment, but I and my husband are on the title. I think that's fine. So it depends on, so if you think about a bank account, right, a, a bank checking or savings account, there's no tax consequences at death for that suddenly belonging to your son or a child that you've added to the title of that account. A house, however, you might have bought for 100000 and today it's worth 300 and you want them to get a step up in cost basis. So if they inherited a death, their basis for tax purposes is the basis at your death. But if you gift part of it to them while they're alive, which is what you're doing when you add them to the title, that can cause a big tax event for them later that could be avoided. The other consideration to adding people on titles is if should they should get into any kind of credit problem. Lawsuit, divorce, you never know what's going to happen. If there's a jointly titled asset, it's possible the creditors could also come after you. So consider that too. Uh, HSA question popping over there. Can you use HSA for health insurance premiums during the gap years between 62 and 65? Oh, I, I want to say, do you remember off the top of your head, Kathy? That one I will check. Yeah, we're, I, I want to say yes. I believe you can. I think that's one of the beauties is that if you're unemployed, you can use your HSA benefits to, to cover your insurance premiums. But we can follow up on that one and, and email you that answer. I've heard the term backdoor Roth IRA. What is this and is it allowed? So a backdoor Roth IRA is where you make a contribution to a non-deductible IRA, which anyone can do. There's no income limitations. And then at some point, you convert that IRA to a Roth. So when you make a contribution to a non-deductible IRA, you get a cost basis. So let's say I'm age 50 or older. I can put $6,500 into a non-deductible IRA. I do that and I just invest it in a money market account. And so a year later, it's worth $6,600. Say it earned $100 of interest. I convert that um, and I pay taxes on $100 of gain only if I had no other IRAs. So, so there's some funny rules about how the conversion works. Um, but the answer is yes, you can fund through what is traditionally called a backdoor Roth or backdoor, yeah, backdoor Roth. There are certain ways that you want to do it so that the IRS doesn't look at it as what's called a step transaction. So you might want to fund your non-deductible IRA for a few years and then perhaps an event triggers that it now makes sense to convert it to a Roth rather than it looking like you every year did that and then convert it on, on a schedule. Next question, Dana, is I uh, believe that you mentioned the maximum income for married couples is 189000 to be eligible for Roth IRAs. If income is greater than that limit, what type of IRA is recommended? So um, just a quick note, one of your handouts called the 2018 Retirement Plan Grid has those specific limits. If you download that, you'll see it under the Roth AGI limit. So what happens technically you're married between 189 and 199,000 of adjusted gross income. Your ability to contribute to a Roth phases out. So you have a $10,000 window where maybe you can only make a, you know, $3,000 Roth contribution instead of 6,500. If you're over that limit, employer plans, if you have any kind of self-employed income, there are all kinds of employer plans you can set up. SEPs, simple IRAs, and individual 401k are great. If you work for an employer looking at their 401k, um, 
and the previous question, you can fund a non-deductible IRA every single year and then look at the right timing to convert that to a Roth. In addition, it's interesting, in the case study we looked at, the big, the blue color, what we just call a brokerage account, I find a lot of people won't save in investments outside of retirement accounts. I'm not sure why that is, but I've encountered many times that people just don't know that they can. So you could, for example, contribute a couple hundred dollars to a mutual fund, um, an S&P 500 index fund at Vanguard. It doesn't have to be inside of a retirement account. There are definitely preferential tax treatments. So capital gains, long-term capital gains and qualified dividends have their own tax rates that are better than ordinary income rates. So there's actually a lot of benefits to just accumulating investments that are not inside any type of a retirement account if you are not eligible to, to use the Roth. I have the first edition of your book. This is a simple question. What is new in the second? So the second is about 75 more pages. There's a whole chapter on estate planning that was not in the first one. The case studies are all updated. I've heard they're a little bit easier to follow. And then there's just additional information. So, for example, in the company benefits section, I added stuff on 72T payments. That's a special way to access IRA or 401k money um, before age 59 and a half. And there are other ancillary rules that weren't in there before that, that we added to, to fill in the content. Uh, Dana, this one is on a um, question about one of the slides uh, for download divorce and retirement, how to take control of retirement benefits. It seems that the address is cut off. Do you see that? Okay, it's right there. I guess. Oh, wiser. B. Yeah. Is, mm, yeah. What? Yeah. Uh, so let's see if I can. Sorry. Wiser Bro. Let me see if I can look it up real quick for you. Can you guys? Oh, you're not seeing that pop up. It's wiser, and then it's B. That's the letter B R O. Divorce. Okay. So it's just so it's wise the letter B. divorce. Yeah, and um, although you're not seeing it on the screen, when I click on this link, it's a live link. It it does work. So when we send you the slides, we also send out a recording. I'll see if we can fix this on the slides because we also send them out attached to a follow-up email. Anyone else have any other questions? Looks like Dana, we we've answered you've answered everything. Fantastic. Well, I know our next webinar is scheduled for August the 9th. It's going to be on best retirement investments. So we'll be talking about annuities and mutual funds and how more, more in depth on how to put portfolios together to deliver reliable retirement income. So if you liked this one, you're welcome to join us. We have all of our past webinars also on YouTube that you can check out. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Have a have a great evening everybody. Bye bye.